this chapter you read is a chapter in a book I'm hoping to finish this year. Uh, I can, I'm brave enough to say that now. And uh, uh, it's a book I've been working on a long time amidst other projects. Uh, and I'll just say about five to seven minutes about it and then questions. So the book is an effort to try and insert Catholicism into narratives of global history uh, in however way that I can. Uh, I would say, so I started graduate school in 1986 and the biggest change in the history business since I've been in graduate school has been a, a deeper appreciation of, interest in, maybe even passion about um, global history. And it's had probably the deepest effect on historians of the United States. When I went to graduate school, uh, I was in the Americanist track, uh, which would be, I, I think I got a great education there, but it was the most provincial of the tracks, uh, the Americanists. And the interest in global history, that is how can we tell stories that have global effects and reverberations, uh, has probably had more of an effect on the Americans than anybody else. Uh, I think it's a, by and large a good thing for the discipline and for the profession and for our kind of shared understanding of the past. Uh, like all fads within the history business, it has probably some disadvantages. And there's a wonderful essay for the grad students in here by David Bell uh, in the latest issue of The New Republic where he sort of criticizes global history. But Bell, even in that essay, says, you know, he was just reviewing a book that I actually have on my shelf, a new 1,300 page history of global history from 1870 to 1945, 1,300 pages, my goodness, um, that has about four references to Catholicism. And even Bell, who's not particularly interested in this subject, says that doesn't make sense. Uh, if you think of Catholicism as the world's most multicultural, most multilingual, and most global institution, we should probably do better, and this is an opportunity for historians with an interest in Catholicism uh, to insert Catholicism in those narratives. So that's the, the, a primary objective for me. Uh, uh, a secondary uh, objective and kind of interest was to do better with these narratives of the 19th century Catholic revival, a phrase that I use and other historians have used, uh, and its opponents, uh, and try to get a little bit deeper, closer to ground uh, on what that meant. Um, in the book that Kyle very generously referred to, Catholicism and American Freedom, I had a little bit of that uh, in there, but I wanted to uh, get closer uh, and get a little more textured feel for what it meant for Catholic intellectuals, and I'll get to the Jesuits in a second, uh, to be engaged in this project of building Catholic institutions and thinking of themselves as citizens of the world and cosmopolitan, and this is particularly true of the Jesuits, in a deeply nationalist age. So how do they resolve that tension? It's a deeply nationalist age for educated people in the 19th century, and yet the Jesuits are being expelled from countries, and I don't get into that here, but the Jesuits are expelled from 20 different countries in the 19th century because they're perceived as anti-nationalists. So that was part of the project. A third dimension to the project is um, uh, the Jesuits themselves are very interesting. And I, I, I mentioned earlier today, I think this is not the book I'm gonna write, but you could write a great book on this puzzle. How was it that the fiercest defenders of papal infallibility, the most fervent promoters of the devotion to the Sacred Heart, the most convinced partisans of the need for Catholics to build distinct institutions like schools and associations and parishes, how was it that that group uh, became the leaders in many ways of the Second Vatican Council? What does that tell us about the council? What does that tell us about the 19th century? And maybe some of our conventional narratives need to be reshaped or, or, or turned around a little bit. Uh, for most historians, that these Jesuits, the ones I write about, are the bad guys. Um, they're kind of a detour from the road to the Second Vatican Council, but that's actually precisely why I find them interesting. Uh, fourth reason um, is, and I'm gonna end the book, I think, uh, with uh, a juxtaposition, of, I mentioned it earlier today, this famous German Jesuit, you know, arguably the most prominent Catholic theologian of the 20th century, this guy named Karl Rahner, gives a speech in 1978 at Harvard, at the Jesuit seminary at Harvard. Uh, and, and just tellingly, he gives it partially in German, which is interesting. And John Padberg, who was here earlier, was at that event. And he says, and this has been a, if you look at it, it's one of the most downloaded articles ever in the history of a theological journal. I realize that may not seem a very large claim, history of a theological journal, but a widely influential article where he says that only at the Second Vatican Council do we see the emergence of a truly global church, that you know, it's first a Judaic church, then it's a Greek and Roman church from the fifth century up and through the, into the 20th century, 
and now we're starting to see something fundamentally different. I'm not sure if that's right, but what's interesting to me is Rahner saying that in 1978 and the debate shifting from identity, which is what the 19th century Jesuits were determined to preserve uh, in an almost curatorial fashion. They wanted to preserve Catholic identity to enculturation, which is the word actually Rahner uses in that famous talk, and a very different mode of engaging with cultures different than one's own. We're now in a moment in many, in many ways in Catholic institutions and Catholic life of identity again, I think, and these things oscillate over time in any great religious tradition. But that's, I think, a fun thing to think about is again this relationship between Catholicism and our global narratives. Uh, Finally, uh, and I kind of wince when I say this, uh, this sounds um, more maybe ambitious or hubristic than I want, but I wanted this book to be accessible and readable and fun. Uh, Rereading this last night, I'm not sure I've got there yet, but I, 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 that's where I want to get, I, I would admit. I mean, I'm going to try and limit it to about 80 to 90,000 words. Uh, I love for it to be the kind of book that gets assigned in classes. I love for it to be a kind of welcoming introduction to what I think are serious and important issues, but told through stories, because it was the stories that captivated me and made me want to think about this material. So the book is organized this way. There's about a 20-page introduction, which I did not inflict on you, but where I try and set out my little theory on the Jesuits in the 19th century and global history. Uh, then there's five chapters. First chapter is about a guy in Maine named John Baptist who gets tarred and feathered in 1854 and what that tells us about Catholic identity and anti-Catholicism, which is a big theme in the book, specifically anti-Jesuitism. And again, the global forces that come to bear on this little town, Ellsworth, Maine. That's chapter one. You're reading chapter two, which I'll talk about in just a second. Chapter three, a few of you, I inflicted this on already, is about the first approved American miracle in the United States. Baps was an exile from Switzerland. Helias is not really technically an exile, though he is in part from Belgium. Third chapter is about a proved miracle in Grand Coteau, Louisiana. A woman named Mary Wilson has a vision of a Jesuit saint named St. John Birchmans, or then becomes St. John Birchmans, and uh, is miraculously healed. And it creates a sensation in Grand Coteau, rural Louisiana. Uh, and then uh, it leads to the, Bert, that miracle becomes one of the two miracles in the canonization of John Birchmans. And so what I like about that again is you get from Rome to this tiny hamlet in Louisiana, and what stories can you tell from that? And her story is very interesting. Fourth chapter is about a guy named Bertrand Villager, who is the villager, as they say, uh, who again is an exile, European exile, kicked out of Europe, sent to the United States, and he builds uh, what for a time was the largest Catholic church in the United States, the Jesu, modeled fairly directly on the Jesu in Rome in improbably, although we take it for granted, improbably, he builds a church model on the Jesu in Rome in North Philadelphia. And, and what, were, what do you do? I mean, how do you explain a guy like that? And then he also found St. Joseph's College. And so I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about architecture and building and nationalism with Villiger. Fifth and final chapter is when American Jesuits have the self-confidence to leave the United States. And I track a group of Jesuits who leave the United States and go to Manila in the early 20th century. And they are taking over there from Spanish Jesuits. And this is a moment of increasing nationalism among the Jesuits. And there's some quite bitter back and forth between Spanish Jesuits who see the Americans as crass modernizers. And um, I remember that these two countries fought a war in 1898, and that's why the Americans are taking over the Philippines. Crass modernizers and the Americans see the Spanish as having none of the get up and go that you need to have a successful American parishes. And, and that's how I think I'm going to end the book, uh, kind of with World War I and the paradox of, uh, in the 1850s, as you see in this chapter with, with the Jesuits, they're very suspicious of national sentiment. They don't want to fight in the Civil War. They don't want to be drafted. They don't want to be chaplains. By World War I, Jesuits from every European country and the United States are rushing to volunteer as chaplains. And I think that's a story, if you write the history of Catholicism, of an assimilation to the nation state over the course of the 19th and early 20th centuries. And that's a story that has positive consequences, I think. It, it explains a place like Loyola in some ways. That's a positive thing. 
but also negative consequences, you might say, too, uh, in, a, in maybe an unthinking patriotism that the 19th century lovers of papal infallibility and the Sacred Heart wouldn't have had. Now, of course, I don't get, well, and I don't get quite, it's a very fair question because I don't quite get into it in this chapter. But I think what you do see in this chapter, a little bit, are two things, and then I'll answer your question. The two things you do see are the Jesuits are suspicious of nationalism. So I kind of begin talking about these Roman Jesuits, and they don't like the nation state, and, and they think it is, they're try, you know, nationalists, and I think nationalists are trying to replace more organic loyalties of family and community with, an, they would say, idolatry of the nation state. And that, I think, filters out with Jesuits worldwide. Now, why would they think that? In part, um, they're coming from a theological tradition. We forget how new the nation state is in the 19th century. They're coming from a kind of theological tradition that points them deeper. And nationalists around the world are saying, because the Jesuits are so loyal to the Pope and the Jesuits are so international, and they really are international. Um, they're not divided into nationalist communities. They have some national squabbling, but it's actually remarkable how little. Okay, that's the mid 19th century Jesuits. By World War I, um, German Jesuits who have been expelled from Germany four times between 1848 and 1905 are rushing to volunteer to serve Kaiser Wilhelm in the First World War. Italian Jesuits, who are part of this, you know, very broad Catholic standoff between the Vatican and the new Italian state, which is pretty self-consciously secular, often quite anti-clerical. Italian Jesuits, we want to volunteer. American Jesuits certainly want to volunteer for service in World War I and see this as a moment to prove <coughs> their patriotism, and they do. Well, how do we explain that? Um, it, again, it's not really in this chapter, but in the book, uh, it's about assimilation to the nation state, a kind of more comfortable position vis-a-vis -vis modernity, uh, a kind of tension between the rhetoric of the Jesuits in the early 20th century, which is still often very anti-modern, and the reality, which is that they look around, especially in a country like the United States, and see themselves to be flourishing. They're doing well. Their, their schools and colleges are starting to prosper. They themselves are um, happy here, and they're not getting kicked out. And, and, and all those expulsions are ending. They get expelled from France and Portugal in 1901 and 1905, and that's it. Uh, and then they're, uh, I mean, you know, after the war, they're expelled from Spain during the Spanish Civil War, but it's a little bit different. So I think that's, that's it. It's a, it's a kind of broad assimilation to the nation state and less migration, less mobility. And, and I'll just make one other small point. The most compelling historians of globalization, you know, this is a very hard thing to write about. And again, David Bell is actually quite clever in this piece. He said, if I read another article that concludes with there was a network or there was a node, I'm going to scream. I'm, I'm paraphrasing Bell here, but that's kind of what he says. And, uh, you know, the, the people writing global history tend to not have great causal arguments. They don't say X caused the French Revolution. They say, you know what, there was a network. Well, I mean, there, what was my point there? I was so enraptured with my analogy. Um, I can't remember what I was going to say, but I'll come back to it. Bob? If I could just follow up on that. Yeah. I wonder if one of the big things that changes between, say, the 1840s and 1914 is that nationalism in the mid-19th century is part of a liberal experiment. Yep. The Europeans are desperately liberal Europeans are desperate to bring on right. and there's a strong conservative movement against it that the Catholic Church is seen as being the largely behind. By 1914, you know, liberalism and nationalism are starting to move away from each other somewhat. Yeah. So is it is it still this illiberal trend or uh, not trend too, but uh, instinct right. in the Catholic Church and particularly the Jesuits? <laughs> That's actually exceptionally helpful. Um, if I were to put it better the way you put it, I would say part of the reaction against the Jesuits in the mid-19th century, again, I talk a lot about anti-Jesuitism. What was that? Why were they getting kicked out and all that kind of thing? Part of the reaction against the Jesuits was the brute fact that often the Jesuits were 
sympathetic to European monarchies and hostile to nationalists. And so there was, I mean, there was, there was a real contest here. Okay. Uh, World War I, I think it's more, it's less that nationalism and liberalism have pulled apart. You could maybe say that in Germany, but you know, then we remember that the Social Democrats are eager to go to war in 1914 too. Um, then it is that nationalism maybe has won and can afford to be more generous and more encompassing. And in the context of the war, nationalists need religious people as allies. I mean, the, the, the German government, for example, during World War I, finally, in the middle of the war, they take time out, it, and, and the German equivalent of a parliament, uh, abolishes all the anti-Jesuit laws. Makes a point of doing that during the war, just to symbolically say, you are part of the nation now. And, and really, the kind of anti-Jesuit impulse in the United States, and, and less so in Mexico and Spain, but but much of Latin America and, and much of Europe is vanishing as I think the need to unite the whole nation around this horrible conflict and these powerful objectives to win the war becomes more pressing. That's very helpful. I, 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 you didn't introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I said Karen Nancy. I teach in this Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a great comment. Maybe we can talk a little bit about how much institutionalism might play into that. And I'm curious how much you can use the idea of sort of Jesuits versus individual personalities. I think what I was really struck by is that you have a lot of individuals running around. Right. And how does, you know, is there supervision here? Uh, you know, I just imagine that you have a lot of sort of irascible personalities right. who have free reign. I wonder how much you actually see a continuity in the earlier period of that, you know, you, you talk about it, the sort of origins of Helios, but of being a suppressed organization and how much they're just sort of used to operating in these little bands or on their own. Can we really talk about an American Jesuitry, if that's the right word, by the 19th century, or are we really talking about a series, maybe the push of sort of free agents who are, what, what sort of pulls them back together again? Have you heard this joke, um, if you've met one Jesuit, pause, you've met one Jesuit, you know, um, <laughs> So, I mean, and, and I am constantly saying, the Jesuits this, the Jesuits that. When, of course, we know there is internal disagreement. So how do I work around that? Um, uh, yes, obviously. You know, if you've met one Jesuit, you've met one Jesuit. And there was internal disagreement within the society about what to do, and there are arguments within different groups. But the coherence is actually, to me, more remarkable than the disagreement. And, and if we were to make a, you know, a generalization about Congress or corporations or the state, we would feel more comfortable probably doing that. That's more comfortable for historians to do. When we think about the Jesuits, well, by the end of the 19th century at least, their training is pretty systematized. They all have this more or less 12 years. They read a lot of the same books. They um, do a lot of traveling and visiting of other Jesuit communities, and so they're zipping around the world. Um, I wonder if there is, by, the, by 1914, there's 16,000 of them. Um, that's a pretty self-conscious, coherent community, all male. I mean, we could kind of keep going and think of the things that they have in common. Um, and I, I wonder how many communities would have more in common. So in any community, there are irascible, eccentric personalities. And of course, the irascible, eccentric, the, the sort of company men don't survive in the archives the way that the irascible personalities do, but I'm pretty comfortable saying there is a Jesuit style and way of approaching the world in the mid 19th to mid 20th century, and I'm capturing part of that. Now, th that gets at your second question, which was, how do you really write a book about these five personalities? Um, I, and it kind of, that is a problem, but I, I'm hoping this book will be a lot more readable than a bunch of generalizations that, I mean, by getting into the, the nitty gritty of each story, I'm hoping your reader will want to say, oh, I want to know more about that. 
mm -hmm. all of the other uh, pieces uh, which were part of the larger Catholic history at that time, and that all contributed to that sense, which the Jesuits sort of had even underscored by this fourth vow. And so therefore, they, they seem to, in many ways, um, uh, become the model for that, that centralized thrust that uh, seems yeah. not to fit in with the kind of nationalist uh, approach, which would, you know, certainly separate all the nations out of one another. And is that part of what gave them uh, kind of a commonality uh, at that particular time? But I'd also like to say, I very much agree with, it wasn't just that the Jesuits or even the priests were running off to become chaplains, it was all the Catholics, yeah. you know, at that time, we were trying to prove they were more American than the rest of the Americans. And, and, and of course, a lot of that came out of the natives. Mm -hmm. too, which again, you were not but here, But here's the distinction. In the late 19th century, my guys, my exiled Jesuits, make a big point of saying they won't vote. Because, you know, we're not Americans, and voting, you know, the whole, you know, democracy, religious liberty, they, they by and large, were not interested in as theoretical projects. Um, how do we get from that? I'm not going to vote. They make a point of scheduling class in their main seminary on Washington's birthday and Lincoln's, uh, Washington's birthday and Fourth of July. So everybody's going to class on Fourth of July. How do we get from that in the 1870s to I have got to, we're all going to go sign up for World War I. And they make a point even of writing to Woodrow Wilson, president during World War I, and saying, hey, we are at your service, Jesuit College. Now there's a little bit of self-interested dimension there because they are eager to get government contracts to staff the schools and a lot of non-Catholic colleges are doing the same thing. But, but they're at your service. And I don't think that could have happened in the 19th century. So something's happened. Mm -hmm. I just want to say this jokingly, but when I was a student at Loyola many, many years ago, yeah. the only holiday we ever had was Washington's birthday in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. No, that's interesting. Well, that's see, there you, there, you there, you there you go. There you go. That's interesting. Um, you know, on the, on the devotional piece as resistance to nationalism, I, my instinct is, is it's only the case in the broadest sense. Because of course the devotional piece takes on a life of its own and is richly variegated and, and goes on, and, and to be honest, is quite popular, right? I mean. One thing, I, I have a little throwaway line, you know, that, uh, that I'm probably gonna take out because it's gonna cause me more trouble than, it. but there, there's a way in which the clerical leaders for all, one can think of all the faults of the clerical leaders of the 19th century, had a genuinely populist touch. I'm not sure we could say that of clerical leaders in our own time, potentially, you know, I mean, they, they had a populist touch for all of their failings. And so they had a, they, they were able to, there was a back and forth, of course, between you know, Catholic people and clerical leaders, and there's often tension, and, 
but there was a pretty good back and forth relative to other places and times in terms of rosaries, devotional projects, Corpus Christi processions. What I think is more significant about those events is the, the way they're able almost wholesale to transfer them from Europe. And, and, and the existing literature often talks about the Americanization, all true. It's slower than you think though. I mean, they are doing, they, I mean, they are proud and they're writing back and saying, this is just like a European village. And that's a compliment about Westphalia in 1855. So to the extent that they're creating a shared Catholic milieu, which they're also doing in Holland and they're doing and trying to do in Brazil unsuccessfully. That's another interesting story. I think it's relatively unsuccessful in Brazil, except among German and Italian immigrants, which would be another dimension if you want to get into that. Um, but they're having a lot of success around the world. That creates an alternative milieu to the nation state. I really do believe that at some deep level, and we see it in, in fact, Bob has written about it in textbooks and other things, Catholic textbooks. Okay, so that's the first question. The second question is, well, how global is their world really? I mean, McGreevy's read a couple of book on, books on global history. It, it's sort of a hot thing. Inevitably, in the second wave of global history, you know, um, you know, another large group of historians is going to jump onto this project and, and, and really how global is it? That's an, actually a pretty interesting, because the world is local. Uh, I do believe that. Um, but I think about my, the chat, and so and if I'm writing about the Jesuits, it's a little easier to say they're global. I mean, they, I mean, they are. I mean, they're, so I have all these Jesuits subscribing all over the United States in the 1850s with personal subscriptions to Civilto Cattolica, which is the Roman germinal, you know, that's the great font of Catholic anti-modernism in some ways, Jesuit edited Roman journal. They just posted the interview with Pope Francis this summer or recently. And, uh, you know, that's remarkable. Okay, we got guys in New Mexico and Maine in the 1850s getting months late their issue of Civilto Cattolica in Italian and reading it. And they're bringing the rosaries and they're bringing the devotional goods. And they're, so I don't think it's hard to argue the Jesuits are global. To what extent is the popular imagination of Catholics that Jesuits come in contact with global? That's, that's trickier. Um, they are more alive to the saints and to Catholic iconography, which is both local, but maybe that's been exaggerated in my judgment, but also it's transnational, you know? I mean, the rosaries are going everywhere. Uh, the one chapter I write about the, in Philadelphia I mean, here's this guy, he goes and measures the Jesu in Rome and he comes back to North Philadelphia and builds it. Now it doesn't quite look like the Jesu, they have all these problems, they don't make money and, and et cetera, et cetera. But that's what he's doing, that's his project. And to the extent that you're shaped by the devotional objects, the architecture, the fact that every week if you're practicing, you're going to a mass where most of the words are in Latin, I don't know. I think there, there is a non-local dimension to that, although of course it's lived in the local. It's kind of funny because here I am, I, 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 my, Kyle generously mentioned my first book, which is all about how you have to do the local, it's parish boundaries, and that's what's really crucial. And here I am sort of working against that, but. I'm Nathan Jeremy. It's a great question. I don't think I manage this very well in the text as it is. I have to think if I can, again, in my 85,000 words, if I can fit this in. But all of these guys had, a, had deep within their bones a romantic notion of North American Indians. 
Okay, where did that come from? Well, it's widely dispersed in Europe in the 19th century, but it's intense among the Jesuits because the Jesuits in the 17th century had been um, you know, famously working with the Iroquois and the Jesuit martyrs in, in Canada. And, and so Baps, my guy who gets tarred and feathered, he sees himself as a successor. Of, and he's working with Indians the first three years. Okay? And Elias thinks he's going to go work with Indians. And, there, and there's a guy, uh, in, I went, spent some time in the Jesuit archives in Paris, and the guy writes back in, in, in French and says, oh, you know, uh, I got the less prestigious assignment. I have to work with the French Catholic, you know, French, uh, you know, French speaking in Louisiana, I don't get to work with the Indians. So the Indians is glamour assignment, that's what it means to be a missionary, that's what you're following the tradition of your Jesuit forebears, hugely attractive. He, I said this earlier today, but here's the puzzle, is that almost every one of them quits working with the Indians after a few years. Now, I don't want to exaggerate that, because there are deep, enduring Jesuit commitments to the Indians, especially in South Dakota, where I'm from, and in the Pacific Northwest. But, but those are isolated. And more or less, it's, I want to go work with the Indians, I want to go work with the Indians. You get over, and it's rough with the Indians. The Indians are being pushed out by the federal government. They're mobile. It's kind of hard to follow them. And there's a cluster who spend their whole lives working with Native Americans and Indians. But most of them get detoured into working, because one of the things that happens in the 19th century, right, is 60 million people leave Europe. About half of those are Catholic. It's unbelievable, human migration. And uh, people are, bishops are screaming, I need priests to work with these Euro-American Catholics, and the Jesuits are worried these Catholics are going to be lost to Protestants. And so they start shifting from work with Native Americans into work with Euro-Americans, and then they start shifting from that into building schools and colleges. And so Helias, my guy here, he's in this little town in Missouri that's just all Catholic. It's still all Catholic. I, I can't remember if I left it in there. There's a... Um, this town is so Catholic, Westphalia, Missouri, that they don't really get a public school in the town until the, did I put this in here? Until the 1950s? I think I may have dropped it. Did I say what they named it? Fatima? Which is unbelievable, right? I mean, you know, they're going to name a public school Fatima. Um, you know, marrying an apparition. And uh, Helias and a lot of these judges are working in these little towns in the 1850s, but they start to drift into away from mission to building schools and colleges for middle class to working class, to be honest, Euro-American Catholic striving immigrants. So it, the Indians are actually a crucial part of the story, a really interesting part of the story because that's what drives some of the missionary energy and it, um, it's kind of what a lot of them think a missionary should be doing. But in the context of this massive Catholic diaspora, they, they sort of shift gears. Mm-hmm. 
So let me, let's think out loud together, because I'm not sure I have an answer for this, but let's think about the question first. In other words, um, which I, I might frame this way, see if you'd agree with this. What real contribution can this book make to global history? Okay, let's start, start there. One kind of narrow contribution, but I'm willing to take, uh, is we need to make Catholicism part of the story of global history, okay? Another slightly broader frame, which I gesture to in the introduction, I'm a big fan of, um, in fact, I will say to graduate students that the best history book I've read in the last 10 years is this C.A. Bailey, uh, what's it called, Rise of the Modern World or something, 1780 to 1914. And, and people interested in global history, this is the book. Now it has all the network node kind of problem. But he has a chapter in there on religion, which I think is terrific, on religion, which is terrific. And his point, is the communication technology of the 19th century, both trains and steamships, but also telegraph and other kinds of technology, forces all great religious traditions in the 19th century to become global, if they weren't, and to become more self-conscious about doctrine and indeed what it is to be a religion. And I don't think this is all original with Bailey, but he would look at um, Islam and say, think about Islam in the 19th century, which, you know, what's the theology of Islam? Well, that's a complicated question, but people have to start answering that question in the 19th century in a new way, because they're bumping into Christians a lot more than they had before. True of Judaism, true to a certain extent of Hinduism. And so the great global religious traditions in the 19th century, the great, let's put it this way, the great religious traditions in the 19th century become more global, self-conscious, Catholicism being the most global of, of them all, become more self-conscious about that and about doctrine and practice and what's orthodox and what's not in ways that those traditions were not as self-conscious about in the 17th century, which is also a global period for Catholicism, but they're not as self-conscious, I think, about orthodoxy. So that would be another slightly broader claim which I gesture to. Methodologically, I don't think I, I'm making any kind of contribution here, really, uh, just to try and de-provincialize a little bit of American history and to, I mean, there, there is an odd way in which historians of Catholicism, hey, the landscape is open, right? I mean, you're, you have an advantage. You don't have to make things up. So what are the big books in global history? The exciting books, I think, are books on commodities. So people writing the history of cotton and oil, and, the, and, and that's natural, that's great. And then people writing the history, I think to me, less exciting of the United Nations, or, okay, and this, I'm gonna kid about this one, Esperanto, and you know, things that, things that bring uh, people together. I, I, Catholicism is, is as exciting a topic for global history as any of these. I mean, these, they're, all, they're aware. Um, you know, by the 20th century, the Vatican has papal nuncios in every country in the country, almost every country in the world. Boy, I tell you, that's global history. But we don't, but people aren't doing it that, that way, I think. So no great methodological insight, I think. But. This is just a, you know, I haven't really finished the whole situation, so don't send me to detention. No, no. They were, they had a global outreach, which, right. know, right. But, I mean, did any of these people in the United States ever refer to, wait, this wasn't one of your middle initials, FX? Yeah, oh, they talk about Xavier all the time. Yeah. And they see themselves as Xavier. Um, I think Ricci's too hot stuff because the, the rights controversy and the controversy over China in, in the 18th century and, and the, how did that lead to the suppression, they don't talk about Ricci. And, and indeed, I don't see him talking much about China, per se. You know, I, I mean, just not be reading the right things. Xavier and the great Jesuit missionaries of the 17th and 16th century are huge role models. One thing to remember in, in organized Jesuit houses, um, you know, in meal times you were read to. And, and those could be the constitutions of the society, but they were often Xavier's letters. And so I actually, amazingly, I have a, I found a reading list of here's the things we're gonna use the next six months to read at mealtime. This is 1905. And they're reading some of the letters from my guy Babst from chapter one in 1905 in New York City, and which tells me again that this tradition of the great missionary, and they're putting Baps now into this category of the great missionary, 
whose letters back full of ethno ethnographic detail of the Indians that he's encountering. So he begins with, I came to this island and I'm the only European. And I speak in French and no one understands me. And then I immediately try and learn the native language. They were all great linguists. Um, and, uh, or thought of themselves as such. Uh, so. Well, even the Jesuit relations would. Right. Hide. And they're very alert to that. The Jesuit relations and this grand tradition. And they themselves in their correspondence are modeling that. They're writing back to their friends in Europe and saying, and then I went to dinner and here were the table manners of the Native Americans and this kind of thing in much the mode of the Jesuit relations. Ellen. Who, who, who does that? Uh. Huh. I don't think I've come across him. I got to find out about this. This guy could. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do know um, uh, infallibility is controversial and, and kind of what you might expect that the, and I don't get into too much detail here about St. Louis or what, I don't, we don't have much, many sources for Westphalia. I mean, there wasn't a newspaper. This is a tiny town, okay. Um, the Jesuits were, were, even in St. Louis, um, I do know that, were very enthusiastic about infallibility. And I think they just kind of politely ignored the fact that the one American to vote against infallibility was Kenrick from St. Louis because they liked him on other grounds. He was generally seen as a friend of the Jesuits he was somewhat sympathetic to the South during the Civil War, and most of the Jesuits have been somewhat sympathetic to the South, I think, uh, in St. Louis. Uh, so I just never found anything that got into that controversy. Um, yeah, and so, but the, what, what, what I liked was even a couple of my Missouri Jesuits are going to Rome and engaging in the pamphleteering in Europe, which is even more hot and heavy than it is in the United States, on the side of infallibility. This is something necessary that needs to be done. And again, they saw it as in part um, the autonomy of the papacy and Catholicism against aggressive nation states. They didn't see it as this is irrational, this is anti-intellectual. They saw it as, well, we are sustaining an autonomous mode of authority. Uh, and because you know all these nationalists are trying to develop schools and, and everything else that are somewhat anti-Catholic. Yes. Uh, they didn't refuse, but they sort of groused about it. Okay, yeah. Right. Uh, there, there were two Jesuits that President Polk uh, sent uh, a scout to the Mexican American one. I'm wondering if there was some sort of change in attitude against the Jesuits. I think there was. I think um, the two Jesuits in the Mexican American War, one guy was named McElroy, and I can't remember the name of the other guy. Actually, it was a Spanish guy, Ray, R E Y. Um, I think it, they were not trained in the, in the old, the, the kind of old means of the site. McElroy became a Jesuit after 18 months of training. Um, I don't remember anything about Ray, but they were not like the people kicked out of Europe who had a kind of more visceral distaste of American nationalism. So I think they were kind of exceptional. Um, the, the great bete noir of a lot of these Jesuits in the 1870s and 1880s, I mean, does anyone know who, that, who it was? Archbishop Ireland, okay, who they see as just a, a kind of um, obnoxious, I don't want to say country bumpkin, but a kind of uh, 
patriotic, Ireland has this phrase, the stigmata of patriotism. He uh, is a Union Army chaplain during the Civil War. He's very eager to demonstrate that America, the United States and, and um, Catholicism can be reconciled. And he has some experiments where he says, you know, we don't really need parochial schools. We could just do religious ed in public schools. And that would be just fine. And he has a couple, well, the Jesuits can't stand that. And no, we need our own schools. Anytime you have schools where the religion is an afterthought, it is really an afterthought. Uh, if we let the state control religious schools, the state's going to control religious schools. Um, and, and we won't control them. And, and compromise is not really an option. They're into building a milieu. And the, for me, and this is just a little kind of insider Catholic history baseball, uh, what we forget is the Jesuits won that argument within the American context. Well, yeah, they are gonna build schools. And, and yes, it is gonna be a milieu. And now the Jesuits had lots of allies in that discussion, but they're the only group that can influence the discussion in Rome, in the United States, in Washington, and in Westphalia. I mean, they have the range, the global range. So I have a couple pages, just to answer your question more directly, about this debate between Ireland and the Jesuits in the, the chapter on Philadelphia. Hi, I'm the first of Jesuits, Yeah. That, say that again? I'm getting rid of the amendments for the states. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and just for everybody's, Blaine amendments are laws passed to try and very strictly prohibit, in the late 19th century, in a lot of state constitutions, to try and very stri strictly prohibit any public aid to religious schools. <coughs> Go ahead, yeah. Um, I was, you touched on the, uh, the licensing case that went to the Supreme Court, and it seems to be the argument in that case Somewhat similar to what John Clinton Murray will say in the 20th century, where you know we're just trying to get Americans to actually do what they say they're doing and actually have this religious freedom. And in making that argument, I was curious if, if there's any effect on the actual Jesuits um, on the ground, or whether that was just an argument that the lawyers were making. Well, let me just spin out the story of the argument for a second, just so people can understand it and then see what they think. So Missouri is this, has a brutal experience during the Civil War. Lots of guerrilla warfare, Confederate and Union armies fighting each other. Helias is kind of caught in the middle. You know, his little parish gets run over by two or three armies. He's accused of being disloyal. Uh, and that's interesting in itself. He, he denies it. I kind of believe him based on what I know. But it's interesting that the Jesuits are immediately accused of disloyalty to the Union and sympathizing with the Confederacy. Um, immediately at the end of the war, Missouri begins the most radical, in some ways, experiment in Reconstruction. And so a pretty radical, anti-Catholic government takes charge in Missouri and says, you know what? We're going to have a loyalty oath that says you can't preach, or then they kind of say administer sacraments or something. I can't remember how it's exactly worded. As, uh, if you were disloyal during the war, you, you just can't do that. So who says that's a great idea? Every African-American minister says, yeah, that's a really good idea because these, some of these people really were disloyal and, and, and we respect that and we were loyal and now we're free if they were slaves and uh, we think that's a really good idea. A lot of more liberal Protestants say, yeah, that's a good idea. We were on the right side in the, union, in the war effort um, and it's, the leading the opposition are what I would call, and this is not the technical term, but kind of hardcore Baptists who don't want any state involvement in religion. And so, but even more important in the opposition are Catholics saying you can't have the state impose a religious test on ministers. This is a violation of what you claim to honor, religious freedom. Well, that's a pretty interesting conversation, isn't it? And it's my guys, the Jesuits, who ultimately get this to the Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, and the Supreme Court, the Missouri State Court, when all the justices are appointed by the Republican government, which didn't allow ex-Confederates to vote, they all say, absolutely. This is part of, you don't allow treason to flourish. And yeah, we can pass this loyalty oath for ministers and lawyers. And the Supreme Court's bitterly divided. And every Republican justice says, you know what, Missouri's right, I like this law. And every Democratic justice, 
says, no, no, this is a violation of religious liberty. And so the Jesuits win, the Catholics win. Uh, because there's one more Democratic appointed justice than Republican justice. So it's a victory, you could say, for religious liberty. But I mean, the, you know, historians all thrive on irony. And there, but there's a, so there's a kind of iron. You're not really, shall we say, fighting with on the right side, if I can put it that way, that uh, uh, here are all these African Americans and liberal Protestants who really did you know, uh, fight to end this war and, and eliminate slavery. And they are the ones who lost the court fight. Uh, and the Catholics won. But I think the Jesuits are not so concerned in this issue about slavery, but they are hypersensitive given their experience in Europe and their attempt to build a Catholic milieu across the North Atlantic to any time the state says, I'm gonna tell you how to run your religion. They're very sensitive. Now, the final irony is, is that these Jesuits actually don't believe in what? Theoretically. These Jesuits don't believe in what, theoretically? Religious liberty. I mean, you go to Italy, they're saying, you know, the ideal is if you could somehow, or Spain, the ideal would be if you could somehow get this state to support the true religion. Now, they do believe in freedom of conscience in that they're not saying you can't think whatever you want in your home. And, you, you know, they always acknowledge that. Whatever you, but the state, should the state really be supporting something that's untrue? Shouldn't the state be supporting something that's true? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? So in the very specific American case, they're having to say, Live up to your principles of religious liberty. Don't, don't put a religious test in. In the global Catholic case, the Jesuits have led the charge, or charge, or recapitulation of Catholic doctrine to say um, it's more complicated than that. Religious liberty should be viewed in the context of other things, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, again, historians really like irony. There's a lot of irony in that story. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't do much with it. Uh, and I would say, I don't think it's a central part of my story. I, I'd be willing to kind of stand on that. That said, uh, Jesuits owned slaves into the late 1830s. The decision to sell the slaves in Maryland is very controversial. Uh, on the one, and it, it's a complicated decision. By and large, the most European of the Jesuits are the ones who want to sell the slaves to avoid what they would think of as scandal. That we probably shouldn't be owning slaves. Um, but then they also recognize if they sell the slaves, they're gonna break up slave families, and they do. Uh, and that's a problem, because the family is the key unit of society, and they were very consistent about saying that's true for slaves and free people together. It's more complicated still in Louisiana, where Jesuits are pretty sympathetic to slavery, and Jesuits, you know, but I don't think it's a dominant issue. Jesuits are actually pretty, um, I don't know if I'd say leading, but interested in working with freed blacks after the war. Uh, and of course, I, I think there are earlier than, than probably most Americans in a sensibility of Africa, and they know people going to Africa. Doesn't mean they carry, they don't carry the kind of cultural baggage that one would associate with missionary ventures to Africa or imperial ventures. But I think they're actually more sympathetic than the norm of Americans. But I don't do much with it. I, I, I just didn't feel like it was central enough in my 90,000 words. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And if so, is there a different one? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I probably kind of get away with a little bit of a cheap shot there because it, it perfectly fits my narrative that, they, that he chose that painting. Now, is there a church 20 years later that they build that doesn't have that painting? It would be an interesting empirical question. Um, so, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, I will say, how, how great is it for my argument, though, that Elias, his mom is wealthy and leaves him some money, and he gets into a fight with the Jesuit provincial about who controls that money, and he says, my, I don't get into this really, but he says, hey, my mom left me the money for church goods, and the provincial says, hey, but you're a vile poverty, the money comes to us. He kind of wins, and he uses the money to buy paintings from, you know, in the school of Guido Reni. I'm trying to get a picture of the painting for the book, I don't know if we'll be able to. They're stunning paintings, I mean, I don't know, you know, if they're authentic. From the 17th century, he carts them all the way from Bologna and installs them in Westphalia, I mean Taos, this is actually in Taos, because he gets mad at the people in Westphalia, he gets kicked out of Westphalia, in Taos, Missouri, which even now is less than 400 people, three paintings from the Italian Renaissance that were popular with 19th century Catholics. That's what's great for my story. I have to admit, I, there's probably a bunch of Jesuit churches out there where they don't do the flagellation, flagellation, flagellation of Christ. But I tell you, almost every Jesuit church of the 19th century I've been in, is they have Xavier, St. Francis Xavier, that a missionary icon. It's just, a, there's an altar or a painting of Xavier. Steve? Uh, I know, that the, got, the other thing is yeah. just, it was just a discovery, and this, this young man is going to just run the yeah. inventory. Um, down at Holy Family, there is a magic lantern, and about 18 to 20 glass slides. And I would put them about 1884. Yeah. Just to then go into the notes. These slides are pictures. That one of the Jesuits, Holy Family, took in Europe a famous sacred heart, as it was to be shown. Uh. Famous sacred heart places, so Pereira Mobile. Uh, one thing that does is the Sacre Cœur. Yeah. 
So they are, it's already on their horizon. Yeah. And this and these remarkable gold vessels that his father smart was, he just didn't believe there were any of these investments in the US and outside part of Europe. And so you're talking about this street down here, you know? Yeah. On the near west side. And I guess this goes a bit to Bob's point to that devotionalism, particularity, populism, um, but transnationalism. What really strikes me in order to do the sacred heart thing and explain to people on the near west side what the sacred heart is, yeah. you have to go to Europe, take pictures of yeah. Montmartre or Rebellion. They're marked to see who the photographer is in Chicago, the transports yeah. from the slides. Mm -hmm. And then you show the slides on magic lanterns to these people down there. So that the uh, that with those vestments, I, I think maybe the the distinction between locality and emotionalism and this kind of transnationalism might be you know blurry. Yeah. Right here. I mean, don't you just love that? That they they feel I mean, what, what strikes me, I guess, is not a novel. They feel compelled to do that. They feel compelled to go back to Europe, take the photos, get the slides. I mean, uh, I don't think American Jews are having the same experience in the 1870s and 1880s, but Catholics are. They have a sense of themselves as part of an international milieu. Um, the core places of our faith are not within 10 miles, not within 100 miles, not with, you know, they have to go 3,000 miles to get to the core places of our faith. It's just striking. Okay, and we're, it's a lot of effort and to get the vestments from, I mean, and that wanes over time. But it's just to show how deeply transnational it is at the beginning. Uh, on Romanticism, you know, we all get bogged down in these words, uh, and I do too. I'm trying, uh, one simple way to cut through it would be the Romanticism of the early 19th century, which you pick, if you pick up a textbook or a book I recommend everybody, Tim Blanning's little short history of Romanticism, which lays it all out in 75 pages. Uh, Catholics love that and they contribute to it. And so figures in Europe like Schelling and others are, are, are really important. And that is anti-enlightenment. Early 19th century, Catholic has influence on the liturgy, a whole range of things. That's one kind of romanticism. Romantic nationalism of the mid to late 19th century, which would include Abraham Lincoln, Garibaldi, Gladstone, Bismarck in a certain way, shape or form, um, there are variants of that. There are kind of variants that we like, Mazzini maybe, or, and variants we're not as attracted to like Bismarck. That romantic nationalism though, a people, a folk, a, a, a folk, or, and, 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 and again, anti-enlightenment in some way, shape or form, Catholics reacted against that. That sense of a very specific people. Now, there are a couple exceptions, I think, to that generalization. One is Spain where I think the play around nationalism and Catholicism is a little bit different, but that's perceived by Catholics in the 19th century as a Catholic country, indisputably. And so I think nationalism in Spain, and then ultimately Philippines, Cuba, is okay. Catholic nationalism. It takes a while for a more Catholic nationalism to develop in Germany, and other places, because nationalism, the Romantic nationalism has been preempted as Protestant or secular. That's how I would try and line it up. I'll readily admit to uh, not necessarily reading the whole article. I grew up. Now, was it not necessarily, or did you just not read the whole paper? I, I, I focused <laughs> primarily on uh, the section. I'm oh, no, just kidding. Go ahead. Okay. 
not that I've seen. Uh, and remember that I think that the period of, of pretty significant anti-Catholic hostility in a place like Missouri is short. It's the 1850s, and then I think there's a revival in the 1870s. But then it, uh, the Catholics are pretty solidified. And uh, I mean, they run the show in Westphalia, but, but even in St. Louis and other places, they're, um, they're doing all right. And so that kind of anti-Catholic hostility that has a lot of mirroring patterns in Europe, I think it's really more the mid 19th century, but that's an important period because that's when the kind of Catholic template, to my mind, of the world that comes to a crashing, not end, but, but co comes to a crash of some way, shape or form in the 1970s, that Catholic template is set, I think, in the 1850s to 1870s. So the fact that there's a lot of anti-Catholic op and anti-Jesuit opposition in that exactly that moment, the moment of the mass immigration, the moment of the building of the institutions, the moment of carting the religious goods from rural France to the middle of Missouri, that's crucial combustible spot. Um, it's, you know, I, I think, I don't think this will be the book that, I put most of my chips on that question, I think, in the last book. And um, I, I think this is a little bit different, a, a book. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you would agree. I would say there have been more good books written on Catholicism in the United States in the last 20 years than in the previous hundred. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a field that's seen a little bit of a renaissance, and I will say, I mean, Bob Orsi is the leading figure in that field. Um, what? Bob, Bob Orsi, right here, is the leading figure. Uh, I'm, pointing, I'm pointing at him, there's Bob Orsi. Um, and, and, and it's that people read that, read his work, has been a really, uh, the fundamental piece of that. Um, so, that's the good news. I think it is true that, um, and, and there's been a lot of interest in the broad historical profession in religion. That too has changed. So when I began my dissertation, it wasn't that anybody said, that's a dumb thing to do, but people are like, you're writing on religion? You know, I mean, you know, just sort of, are you sure? You know, uh, and, but has the national narrative, which everyone wants to be a part of, integrated Catholicism? I think not. Um, and, and I just, I don't know how to, exp I mean, there'd be an interesting conversation to have as to why that is. I don't think the monographic literature, as good as it is, and it's often really quite good, has had the impact that we might have thought it would 20 years ago. I think, I think it's better. People are kind of open to it. People know who Bob Orsi is and, and maybe a few other figures, and that, that matters, I think. But um, it, it's still not great. Yeah. Really opened it up. But I guess the question I have is in writing Catholic, so called American Catholic history, do we do anything to expand our understanding of that, for instance, in relationship to other groups such as Protestants, Jews, etc., and so forth? In other words, we may complain on one level that Catholicism isn't integrated, but I think we have a great need for a really ecumenical interfaith. Maybe also as close to that as yeah. others, but I mean, you know, goes both ways. True, uh, although I have to say, so like uh, John Butler, who's a very prominent historian, recently retired from Yale, has two or three times in my presence, I, I never get to go to conferences anymore, so I, I haven't seen him in a while, but he'll say something 
to the following. I love all the fact, there's, there's these good books being done on religious history, it's really great. But the tragedy is there's no comparison. So you don't compare the Protestants and the Jews or the Catholics and the Jews, and that's really a big problem. And I think analytically he might be right, but if I try and think of a single book where that's been done, I, I be, I'm gonna be exaggerate for the sake of effect. I think, oh my God, I'm so bored. You know, because I don't think it's been done very well. I, I don't think the people who write the monographs that matter, the people who have a, kind of a passion for it and they have an angle and, and they're really emotionally there. And if you begin with, okay, Protestants chapter one, Catholics chapter two, Jews chapter three, I just don't think it often plays out very well. Now there are a couple exceptions to that. So I don't think that's the future. I think the future is more great monographs that get people excited and they think, wow, that really does, th that, that small thing really does change how I look at that. Then it is a self-consciously ecumenical appropriation of the past. I, I myself, so Jay Dolan, who I, you know, my former colleague, fabulous guy, he wrote a book on the Catholic Revival, which is a very smart book, I kind of understated, under, underestimated book. And he said, look at the Protestant Revival, look at the Catholic Revival. I'm writing this book and, say, and I'm saying, I don't think the Jesuits cared much about the Protestants, honestly. I think they cared about Jesuits in Europe. That's what, and they were carting over, they weren't really looking at the great Protestant Revivalists who they sort of scorned, honestly, as below them, these, you know, and, and they're looking at a, a deaf, and Jay, not that Jay wouldn't recognize this, but I think that's what's really going on. It's not the back and forth. It, it's amazing in a way how little contact they have with religious leaders of other groups. Now it's civil and formal and, and I don't think there's, not, there's very little open hostility, but they're not, they're talking to each other, I think. So, oh yeah, sorry. A little bit, I would say, yes, westward. And there's a famous uh, piece in 1831 by um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's father, blanking on his name now, famous minister, saying, um, Lyman Beecher, uh, who, watch out in the west, the Jesuits are going to take over. And I quote that, you know. But, but of course, it's true in the east, too. It's not just about western expansion. And I really think this is part of a, a global narrative. Now, there's distinctions that you can make, but anti-Jesuitism in particular jumps alive in the 1840s everywhere. Well, why is that? The Jesuits are more visible. They're getting kicked out of Europe and they're moving around the world. The, um, again, it's around nationalism and nation states. And, and I don't get into it too much here, but there's, a, uh, there's an interesting thing about these anti-Jesuit novels where there's always a a woman imprisoned by the Jesuits, and there's a sexual dimension to it, and lots of interesting things about that. Uh, so I see, even in a little town like Ellsworth, Maine, I see, the, I see these European currents coming to bear there, independent of Western expansion. I think that's a part of it. And you see, anti, you see both Philo-Jesuitism, that is, I think the West is a little bit more open, and, and so there's less hostility in Chicago than there is in Boston. But you see anti-Jesuitism that, that you could almost read the same thing in Brussels and Rome that you're reading in Chicago. Or you could read it in Mexico City.
that's interesting. Well, these fathers follow the Jesuit sort of formula. They learn the Indian language, and they set up schools in which they taught the Indians to read and write in their own language, to sing hymns in their own language. Uh, and, and they would also teach them French. Yeah. But they didn't teach them English. And the Indians thought this was great, because they had the government coming down on them. Yeah. I'm not going to directly answer your question, but here's what it brings to my mind, which, which for me is this great thing, right? I, we all like the word enculturation and acculturation. That's a sensitive word. You know, it's good, it's good not to just impose your values on somebody else. Um, the Jesuits of the 19th century, so my guys, uh, are deeply transnational. They're zipping around the world just like you know, executives for an NGO now or something. They um, are committed to native languages in a way that actually most Protestant missionaries are not. And so they, they, they are, first thing. You try and learn um, Tagalog in the Philippines, you try and learn uh, Native American Indian languages, you know, tough languages, Mi'kmaq and stuff in, in the Pacific Northwest, okay? Very committed to that, those 19th century Jews. They don't believe in acculturation at all in a sense. So what do they do? What do, so they go to rural Montana and they build a church to the Sacred Heart. And it's, it's kind of a gothic thing. They can't imagine something else. They make a, they found the, the, the Ateneo de Manila, which is still the leading prep school or high school in, in Manila. It's a Jesuit high school. It's founded the exact same year or two years apart as the Jesuit high school in Philadelphia. When the American Jesuits are sent to Manila, and this is a great moment, right? The American Jesuits are going out now after 300 years of European Jesuits coming in. American Jesuits are going to Manila and they're going to take over Manila, the Jesuit mission there, and run the school. And somebody says, hey, what are we going to teach over there? No, no problem. The classes are exactly the same. The textbooks are exactly the same. Don't worry about it. So they're doing exactly the same stuff with kids whose native language is Tagalog in Manila as kids whose native language is Irish and Italian, or you know, English and, and Italian in Philadelphia. So, global, um, uh, sympathetic to native culture in the sense of really trying to work on the language and all of that, but not acculturation. In other words, I don't think the Jesuits went to Manila, really thought they were gonna learn anything from the kids in the class about what they should be teaching. That's the distinction I wanna make. It's not, they're, they're about identity. And you can be very sophisticated about, you know, you, you know, they weren't telling people how to dress necessarily, they kind of were in Manila, but, and, and all that. But they weren't about, your culture is as good as mine, I'm gonna learn from your culture, therefore that will shape what happens in the school, which would be a more contemporary attitude. That's not the 19th century. And indeed, I would say, in Catholic institutions, and, and I'd be one of them, saying we might want to circle a little bit back toward identity as opposed to simple acculturation, because the most powerful cultural force is now, you know, the market. You can think of the, what they are. Uh, so. so, on that note, before we yep. leave, I wonder if I could do one And I wonder if we could all turn to the last page. Uh-oh. The absolute gorgeous example you've given of the free printed prayer card. And I'm really curious, if you've seen this before, and actually that's not my real question. My real question yeah. is, what's, what is going on with Helios at the end of his life? So he, has Helios, well, I guess maybe I'll throw, I mean, yeah. has Helios become American? No, I don't think so. I, I, I mean, he's, he, he, so he, this is a guy who sh comes from Belgium to Missouri in 1838 and spends 45 years in rural Missouri. As far as I know, never goes back. Goes through the Civil War, all these conflicts. Okay, so this is a true missionary. And one thing that Jesuits, I mean, it's amazing how many of them, they had to go out to a place they'd never heard about before, 
And they were told by the Father General, this could be for life. And, and, and kind of suck it up, and this is how it's going to be, and it often was. So some American kid, Irish kid from Philadelphia, is in the rural you know, Cebu in the Philippines for 40 years. Okay, that was common. Okay, now, so uh, Helias goes out there, uh, and he, so he's assimilated to Missouri Catholicism. This is his achievement. He hasn't been in Europe since 1838. And, and what does he say? What does he say is going to be his epitaph? He's had all these controversies. He's gotten mad at his parishioners. He got kicked out of one parish. He went to another parish. He's built seven churches. He reminds them, as he tells us. He reminds them. He says, Flanders is my origin. France instructed me. That's true. He had to, you know, he, he had to flee Fran uh, Belgium, effectively, to France. Gets, had shelter in Switzerland, Rome, and Italy until the day when heaven led me toward you, people of Missouri, my second fatherland. Um, so he's charting his self-narrative, his narrative, as part of this global Catholic drama. Is there a profound insecurity behind that? Is there, at the end of his life, <laughs> hmm. no, a concern that he's, that he's been eclipsed? That Dane is building, so yeah. that the move is already moved towards the cities, that there he is out. There is something to that. And that he has to. Nobody else is going to remember him. Yeah. I'm just sort of curious what, you know, not that we can get into his mind too much, yeah. but, but what was the ultimate, what did he see his contribution? I, I think you're right, and I could do more with this. On the, um, he has one letter where he complains about they're taking all these guys, Jesuits, and bringing them back to St. Louis. We were out here. We were in the middle of nowhere, and we were building churches and serving these people, and now they're going back, and Hyatt himself had been, you know, was well educated and had taught at St. Louis University, but now that's becoming the norm. Or you're in these easy urban parishes, as opposed to kind of rough life out in the country. He does think that. Um, yeah, but I, so I, I would agree with that, and, but just say, you know, he sees himself as part of a, I try to say, it, international or global Catholic story in the 19th century. Look at my child, look where I ended up. Yeah. Well, thank you very Thank much. you. You're very patient.